be on Referee Rent. Like you said, we was on there uh, when it first started and to see uh, where it's where it's going uh, and where it is right now is amazing, Ralph. So keep doing your thing. Um, but we're doing excellent. Yeah, we, we're happy to be on. Um, thanks for having us uh, the first time and then actually bringing us back for a second round. So uh, we're very thankful and we, we like to show gratitude wherever we go. Um, so we're, we're doing extremely well. We woke up, we opened our eyes this morning. So, you know, those are two blessings that you can't overlook. Yeah, that's the least common denominator at this point. But I did want to go back to November. So there was a little open run at Island Garden. And, and Gabby, I think you was probably in the best shape that you've been in in a very long time. Your, your jump shot is still wet. I mean, <laughs> you was playing defense with, with, with Scottie Pippen. I mean, Michael Jordan. I mean, Aisha Walker. <laughs> You know, when y'all two are together and, and you get that competitive spirit going, it's really an amazing thing to see. And then and I was like, y'all need to get back on. And then all of a sudden you went to North Carolina. How, how did that happen? Um, you know, we wanted a change for our family. You know, we, we've been in um, New York for uh, some time now. Um, definitely um, explored the avenues that we could in New York. And we wanted to, you know, change. We're, we're college coaches at heart. Um, so, you know, North Carolina has a lot of colleges down mm. here. We wanted to put ourselves in the best situation that we can. Okay. All right. That, that's a good answer. And um, obviously we've been dealing with the pandemic for such a long time. You know, I was always watching your stories and I'm really happy that you guys got a chance to be able to use that outdoor court before when you were in New York mm -hmm. and to be able to have some sort of semblance of just positivity with kids. Right. So, you know, I want to go back. First of all, how are you guys holding up with this whole thing? Um, how's the rest of your family? And also going back in March around a year ago, around this time, when was the moment that you took the pandemic really serious? Because a lot of things were tied into the things that you were doing. And then all of a sudden, it was really hard to get gym space. It was too cold to go outside. So I'm sure you had to pivot. And I, if there's one thing that I know about the Pauls, they're really good at pivoting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we, first of all, we, we want to say, um, you know, we, we truly are, uh, we feel sorry for anybody that's been affected by COVID, uh, whether your family members have been sick or whether you have been sick, uh, but we've been blessed to still have our health, uh, to be able to still do the things that we love to do. Um, obviously, you know, things kind of change the way that we move and how we actually conduct our business. Uh, but for us, it's always it's always about an opportunity to grow. Uh, we don't look at, at things as a negative or as a problem. We're always looking for solutions. Uh, so when COVID first hit, you know, um, I was teaching uh, in Queens, New York at Masper High School. Um, so I was commuting back and forth. And then all of a sudden, you know, they told us we wasn't coming back into the building. I think I still had my workout clothes in my my uh, my gym locker at that point, uh, thinking I was going back to school that next day. Uh, so, you know, once they said that we weren't going back to school and they didn't know how long, that's when I realized that, you know, hey, this is a very serious thing that we're dealing with. I'd never been in school and they, they shut down school man. for for anything. <laughs> like, so for me, I was like, man, this is, this is really crazy. And especially to see the city of New York that never sleeps to be shut down and to not see people moving and things like that. It definitely uh, kind of hit us hard at home, but you know, a couple of things that we thought about was, you know, how do we want to come out of this? Uh, we know that uh, if God blesses us to be able to see the end of this and actually get through it, how do we want to be seen as we come out of this? And I know that, you know, we're a positive family and we're positive people, but, you know, positivity don't put my, no money in my pocket. Uh, so I was like, hey, you know, I really want us to come out with different things that are tangible that we can either teach other people or different things that we can actually say that we have as a direct result of us working on ourselves uh, during this time. So, you know, we really took the time to develop as a family, to develop as a couple. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we took a day a week and we had our own Bible study together where we prayed and we read the Bible together. Uh, we actually had time to really work on our business, you know, for, for all the entrepreneurs and the small business owners out there, it, it's very difficult when you're working a job and when you're coming back home and you're still training and you're running from gym Man, to gym, um, you know, you're working in your business, but you're not working on the business. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of systems, strategies, structures that uh, we didn't have time to build. We didn't have time to invest that time into that side of our business. So this actually gave us a lot more time to, to sit down and build out different things on the back end of our business that can ultimately help us to uh, be more lucrative and to have a better profit margin 
Uh, so we've been able to work on those things and come out and actually see the fruit of our, our labor. You know, now we're, we're coaching other business owners. We're mm -hmm. helping other people uh, to build their dreams and take, take these ideas that they have and turn them into lucrative opportunities for their families. Yeah. And also, um, uh, wh while the pandemic, we was working on athletes mindset. Um, so, you know, we were training a lot of kids and as we trained them, we was working on the athlete's mindset, but we didn't really get to sit down with them and, and talk about it. So we jumped on here like we are right now, um, had a video, uh, a Zoom, and we just literally went through the game of basketball. What do you need to learn? Because a lot of kids are lacking that. Right. And so that's what we and we continue that to now to today. We are coaching student athletes right now um, on um, just knowing the game better. And it's it's really been helping helping them out. So I'm going to I'm going to stick with Gabby on this one. So, you know, going back to those early months of the pandemic, March, April, May, it must have been so difficult because you had so much face time with the kids that you guys were coaching and training. Right. And then all of a sudden, inexplicably, they tell you. Yeah, DOE is not going to be opened up. There's going to be no gyms and we had no idea. And then it's like after a month's time, you're just like, wow, this this is really not happening. Man. That connection, you know, I'm still trying to figure out the con and the way I was thinking about it, too. When I watch Devin on social media, I'm like, this guy is going to come out of this so much more elevated because you're doing all the things that people are trying to catch up to. Right in the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know that there was a whole bunch of DJs on Instagram. There was a whole bunch of Zoom meetings. People didn't know how to use it and that you could see the inequality of it. But, you know, somebody like you and I, we have always been ahead of the curve in terms of the tech. So, Gabby, what do you think that you did that was like unique where you kept in touch with these kids, right? Trying to still train with them through Zooms. Like, what were you doing with these kids? And what, what kind of words of encouragement were you giving them when they're training for, they don't even know when's the next time they're going to be on the court? Yeah, so um, we just tried to keep that positivity in them. Um, like you said, we did a lot of Zoom training. The Zoom training was like a hit, yeah. you know? It, it was fun to, um, to, because now they had to take what they saw and implement it or take what we were saying and implement it. So that just built a skill for them um, on it in itself. Um, so Zoom uh, basketball training was fun. And the best thing, like I was just saying before, was the athletes' mindset calls. I mean, man, we was breaking down how to be coachable, um, self self evaluation, um, just different things for them to become a better player. I mean, that in itself, we had a lot of great feedback from the parents, um, from the kids. Um, even still to this day, we still, like I told you, we still talk to some of them about it. Yep. What about you, Dad? Um, you know, pretty much the same thing, you know, building that athlete's mindset um, and being able to help them to understand that it's not just about what you know on the court, uh, but it's more about what you know in, in between the lines, which is your, your, your headspace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, focusing on the controllables. That's what we really work with our student athletes on. You know, the things that you can control, you can control what you're doing with this time. You know, maybe it, it's not the ideal situation, but all you need is a basketball and a slab of concrete. Man. So this is your time to work on that handle. You know, maybe you didn't have a, a good handle when, when we were actually in person and you were able to be on the court. This is now a time where you can work on those things. So really getting them to understand that, hey, you need to really max out and make a personal game plan for yourself. So we walked them through that strategy. Um, and, you know, every week we were on a call just like this. And we had, you know, 20 to 30 kids and their parents on this call. And we were also talking to the parents about, you know, great things that they could do to still utilize uh, all of these assets that they have as far as the talent in their kids. So I think that being able to really get them to, to hone in on like, hey, you have things that you're actually controlling right now, mm -hmm. whether it's your effort whether it's your attitude, whether it's what you do in the dark, you have control of those things. So now it's all about controlling the controllables. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I would have never thought that we'd get to a point where, you know, every time I, I drive around, especially like in Long Island, you'll go like, you'll see your basketball hoop and you'll go, wow, that hasn't been used in like 15 years. Man, I see a lot of rules. That don't live here no more. You know what I mean? But yeah. then you see like April, May, June, all of that was gold. It was yeah. gold because that was really the only thing, especially like in the city. They had all of the rims down, um, you know, talking about that pivot of being able to still connect with them through Zoom. Do you think that's kind of what 
catalyze you to move to North Carolina? I mean, obviously you guys are always looking for opportunities, but just the fact that you're still able to connect with kids and it's not face to face. Do you think that's, that's one thing that, that made you go like, well, we could still probably make this move and still connect with these kids and still make a positive impact in their lives. Absolutely. We learned that, um, that we could do our business anywhere mm. from our phone, from a computer, all we need is Wi-Fi. So that, like you said, that definitely helped us um, on the jump. You know, a lot of people are scared to make a leap of faith, take a leap of faith. And, um, you know, we're, we're very bi biblical based. So we, we saw our opportunity and we took it and ran with it. Yeah, you know, um, to go along with that and to piggyback on that, uh, you know, we talked about what we want our life to look like. So we sat down as a family and we Absolutely. said, you know, hey, in three to five years, like, what does this look like for us? What do we want to do as a family? Uh, so when we looked at it, we said, hey, you know, we would like to get some more space. We would like to be in a different a different area. Uh, so we started to reverse engineer that and say, OK, so what about our training business? Like, obviously, if we want to pick up and leave, you know, we also don't want to leave the people that we've been able to have an impact on and be able to contact them. Um, so we started building as if, you know, hey, what if we just picked up and left yet tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And that's how we started to kind of pivot our way into being able to move. You know, we didn't just pick up and move like we we talked about it. Yeah. We strategized. We uh, we sat down with a lot of our advisors. You know, we have a board of advisors and a team that we talk to um, as a family before we actually start making moves. So after we put together a strategy. Um, and that strategy did include making sure that we were able to be on Zoom calls like this with our student athletes and actually having a digital program where they can go to a video library and go through these same things that we're talking about. So if, if we're not there in the flesh, they still get that attention. They still get that type of um, uh, the same type of love and feel that they would get as if we were there. Obviously, it's not the same, but you know, yeah. we try to be, be as close to, to that as possible. Yeah. And we work with a lot of uh, coaches as well. Um, grad assistants, um, uh, what is it, uh, assistant coaches. We did a podcast um, called The Coaching Corner, um, which really hit uh, during the pandemic. Um, and that was just, we brought on um, coaches that we know, high level coaches, um, and they just gave us like, they, they gave some great information on how to get to the level that they um, was on. And that was another platform that we built that was, was really good. Yeah, I think it's it's so invaluable to bring those types of coaches to have different perspectives. And also, you know, I, I know for me, you know, I, I watched a video of Gabby playing in high school and I was like, man, I wish I had like a fraction of that confidence. I wish I had somebody that gave me that talk. But, you know, that's why I feel like I go hard now, because, you know, at least I learned it at some point And now mm -hmm. I can and implement, implement it in my life now. Um, you know, this whole time, too, I would say for me. I really had to take a pause on refing, obviously, because it really didn't exist. And I realized how much I enjoyed my family. I realized how much I enjoyed Long Island. I realized how much I enjoyed just being with my son. And I felt this, man, I, I, maybe I was just like out all the time. Like mm -hmm. I got to be somewhere at seven. Then I got another game at nine. Then I don't really see anybody. And then in the morning. So, you know, I, I feel like family means something a lot different. Not to say I wasn't a family man from jump, mm -hmm. but do you think that it, it basically balanced out how hard you guys were going and you feel like you, you want to have, you know, more of a balance of, of just having your family time, your me time. Man, you could get swallowed up in New York and Long Island. We're working and working because you have to. Um, so um, the pandemic really, I, we, we always say like it, it uh, slowed us down to speed us up literally. So, um, so we were able to just think I, that was our biggest thing. Like, you know, we was hustling and bustling and going from our work to training to repping. Like you said, I mean, Ralph, I saw you everywhere. You, you were in every gym going from one thing to the next thing all the time. <laughs> there was times where I see Gabby, like I see her at one gym and then I'll see her in another gym. And I'm like, you here too? Like the third no, gym. <laughs> oh man so um just having that slow down time and like you said to be able to spend time with your family um was uh, man it, it was amazing yeah yeah you feel the same way too Devin? oh most most definitely man. uh just being able to have that clarity like i said you know we we had things that we wanted to do but uh just like you said you know i think you put it in a, a great 
great format when you said, you know, I'm, I'm a family man, but you know, sometimes when you out and you, let's just be honest, you gotta get the bag. You know what I'm saying? Like you gotta make sure that the family is in a, a situation that uh, where they can win and they can prosper. Uh, so, you know, that's what you were doing and that's what we were doing. And when we say trust the grind, you know, I'm talking about waking up at four o'clock in the morning, doing my morning routine, driving to the city, teaching for a full day, Man. driving back home for an hour and a half, yeah. two hours, going to a training session, going to a practice, going to uh, school at Brooklyn College and then coming home. And you talk about nine, 10 o'clock at night. I'm talking about trusting the grind. Yeah, so, sure. you know, um, it's hard to have a date night in the, between that. You know what I'm saying? So, um it definitely gave us an opportunity to really focus on our family. Now, Devin, I want to stick with you. Just this whole time, this whole year, what do you think you learned about yourself during this whole time of pause? Man, you know, um, I've learned a lot and I've also uh, grew, you know. Um, I think that, and I, I use a, a, a tool with all of my personal clients where uh, they take this tool and this tool actually identifies out of four different personality types. It really breaks down uh, what your dominant animal is. So it's four different animals in this tool. And the first animal is the lion. And this is the person that's driven by results. This is the person <laughs> that really <laughs> wants to just get the job done. My wife, a dominant animal is a lion. Mm -hmm. uh, the second animal is a flamingo. This is the person that is driven by other people, inspiring, outgoing, energetic. If I had to take a guess, I would say uh, Ralph is definitely a uh, flamingo. flamingo. <laughs> uh, then you have a chameleon. This is the supportive status quo person, uh, just a natural born team player. Then you have the turtle. This is the person driven by details, uh, also task orientated, but they, they take a little bit longer to get the job done because they don't wanna do it the wrong way. Um, so once I realized and broke down, you know, what my dominant animal is, and I identified that I have all four of these animals. So I really wrote down my weaknesses and how I can grow. And one way that I really focused on was applying the information that I already knew. Um, I think sometimes we can be what I call information hoarders. Uh, well, we could take in all of these new things. We could learn a, a bunch of new stuff. And, I, and I'm a, I'm a per personal development junkie. So, you know, I'm getting all these, these great gems. I'm getting all of this great advice and I'm just holding it in. I'm not doing nothing with it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, I'm going to execute on these things and I'm going to, I'm a, I'm a bridge that gap, you know, and whatever gap it is, like Babe said, we started that whole platform for coaches. Uh, and that was really built off of just using the resources that we had access to, you know, the relationships that we already had built from coaching for years uh, at the college level, you know, we just picked up the phone and called those people. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I, I finally d discovered that I had to take action. I couldn't keep talking about things. I couldn't keep thinking about things. I had to stop overthinking and underperforming. I had to be real with myself and look in the mirror and say, am I getting the results that I want? No. I'm not getting the results that I want. How can I put together a structured game plan that measures what I'm doing every single week to help me hit my monthly target goals? And that is what is what been able to really help me um, to understand what I need to get better at and to actually hit those things. That was the most detailed I've ever seen somebody answer that question. You know what I learned from asking that question like a hundred times? Yeah. Everyone's always like, I learned how to be patient. So I learned that there's many people that are just impatient. Just completely <laughs> at all, you know, but Gabby, I'm gonna bring it to you. What do you think you learned about yourself during this whole time of pause? Um, you know, I learned, um, I learned to, to, to sit down and, um, and consume the information that I need. Mm -hmm. I was so much on the go that I never stopped and thought. Like there's so much that I can give to a student athlete that I wasn't because I haven't sat down and thought about all the things that I went through in AAU basketball and high school basketball and college basketball, playing professional three on three, like all of the, all that, all the, the uh, adversity that I went through in those stages of my life, I need to be explaining this to um, the student athletes that we have now. And I was able to um, sit down and write stuff out and share this information with um, other student athletes that could really help them. Cause you know, once you give them that personal um, insight, you know, personal story that you have them now, yep. you know? So to be able to think about, to think, <laughs> to be <laughs> able to think and not be on the go was a game changer for me. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you, you get so much experience by just being in the field and which is great, but sometimes we can't conceptualize things and really let it, con 
you know, sink in because we got to do it again tomorrow. So we don't get, we don't got time for that. We we're just going to do it by the field. So when you have that perfect balance, I think you, you're probably living your best life. Now I did want to ask you just on the training side and the coaching side. I mean, you guys were staples around New York tri-state area, but you know, I don't, I do know that that coach Paul over here, you have done some traveling before you've been in and around Kentucky, you've been other jobs and, and Gabby, I know you went away to school and you did some, some traveling around yourself. Um, but you know, I think that when you build something, you, you get so you get so married to like, this is where my home base is. I can't leave. I can't leave my clients. I can't leave my train. Like, it, it's so hard to just pick up and transition and then start from scratch. But you know, I think the pandemic has showed us like, you don't necessarily have to start from scratch. But what planted the seed for you guys to go to North Carolina? I'll start with you, Devin. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, like you said, you know, I've, I've, I've traveled a lot. You know, um, I started my coaching career at Kentucky State University. So I lived in Kentucky for years. Uh, my family actually moved to Kentucky when I was uh, around the age of 10 or 11. Um, so I was really raised in Kentucky, born in New York. So I lived in Kentucky. I, I, I took a job at Marshall University as an assistant coach. So I lived in Huntington, West Virginia, which if ain't nobody been there, you, there's no reason for you to go there if you ain't working <laughs> in Marshall or watching the Marshall football game. So, uh, I mean, um, you know, so I lived in Huntington and then I moved to New York. Uh, so I've, I've been a, a few different places as well as when I was recruiting, just going to different places and uh, being amongst a, a different type of culture. Um, so, you know, for me, it was all about the family that we don't have yet. You know, uh, we, we eventually want to have kids, uh, hopefully pretty soon. Uh, and, um, you know, just looking at different environments where we would like to raise our kids, as well as putting ourselves in an environment where we could thrive. Uh, so I'm very big on, you know, not just surviving in life, you know, don't just take what life gives you, you take what you want, you become who you want to be, you go out and you strive so you can thrive. So I was looking for somewhere where we could actually thrive as a family. Um, and, you know, we have some family in North Carolina, you know, my best man to, to our wedding, uh, Vansell Hawkins, which is like a brother to me, he actually lives not too far away from us. Uh, so I, we just was like, hey, you know, let's take a trip and let's go see if we even like it. So Babe was talking about coming on a visit. So we actually visited um, during the summer, right? Yes. It was, it was like probably like July. July. Uh, so we, we took a trip to get away from New York, uh, get away from, you know, just being isolated in our, our house and using the basketball court. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we came out here, we was like, you know, hey, we like the area. Obviously, you know, because of the pandemic and stuff, you couldn't really go many places. Uh, but we we like the environment, we like the space, and we actually almost had bought a house. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we like we didn't like, intend to, but we yeah. were so close. Yeah, too. we started like looking at different places, and one thing led to another, and we was like, oh, we kind of like this house. And next thing you know, uh, we we went back home after our trip, and I was like, you know, I I, I don't think we're ready to buy a house anywhere else yet, but I do think that we're probably ready to to make that next move. So. We kind of just just focused on what we need to do in order to to get somewhere else, which was, you know, we're very big on our finances. So we put together a strategy to make sure that we didn't have any debt. Uh, you know, we want to make sure like we, we're not leaving with baggage other than the bags that we already have. So, you know, we came back and we really just put our head down and, and just kept working and uh, just making sure that we were ready for a, a move to come. Uh, we didn't really know if it was going to be in North Carolina or not. We had liked North Carolina. That was a place that we visited, that we we wanted to go to. Um, we liked the Charlotte area. But then when we went to Greensboro, we was like, you know, this is a smaller city. Uh, and we think that we could do another basketball training business here. Uh, we was also looking as business owners. We're looking for different places where we could put a stamp on. Um, so we looked at this area and we said, hey, we think that we can, we can have an impact here. And they got some great student athletes out Man. here. They take sports extremely Very serious. Uh, so, you know, we thought that this would be a good opportunity for us. And once the pandemic hit and a lot of uh, teaching opposition, uh, positions became available and people are really looking for teachers right now, um, you know, it's just kind of all of the incentives just kind of lined up for us to be able to have an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, Gabby, I, you know, I think about if you're a trainer on Long Island, gold is having a court, right? So sometimes people are married and like, I, I can't leave this court. I got this nice deal. And, you know, you start yeah. thinking like emotionally as opposed to going like, you know what? I can I, I am me. I, I can make my own path anywhere I want. It's going to yeah. work. I, I did want to know, like all of the kids that were under your watch, 
what kind of conversation did you have when you said that you were leaving? Because for me, it was like inexplicable. I was like, one day you was at UFC gym, the next day you were at Greensboro. I was like, man, this must have been like some mastermind move that I had no idea. And it just kind of came out of left field. So I, I'm sure that you had to do this really delicately, especially with your friends and all your colleagues. And then, of course, all, all of the kids that you train. How did that go about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the uh, pan the pandemic really um, uh, helped us out in that system because we weren't training all the people that we normally do train. Um, so it was a little bit easier to let them know uh, what we were doing. Um, so we kind of eased it out. Like all the people that have packages, we let them know. Um, and um, and then we still stay in contact with them. You know, we still have our uh, tech service where we text them, seeing especially like Long Island is in basketball season right now. So they're sending us their uh, Newsday uh, clips and some videos and watch this link. And so we still stay in a lot of contact with them. So I would say the COVID kind of helped brace the fall mm. for sure you know mm. um but it was really hard you know i lived in new york all my life except for when i went to massachusetts right. um, for four years for college um so leaving my family and everything it was hard it was hard but um you know we were we were ready to build our own family you know we're ready to build our own family and um just new experiences i'm always down for a new experience and i've always said you can always go back Right. You can always go back to, to we can always go back to New York. So um, and then the the, the um, to build a new business. I want to it's fun to me. You know, let's build a new business. Now we know exactly how to build it. You know, before New York, it was just like we was winging things. You know, we were winging things five years ago. So now that we actually know what works, what structures work. Now it's just fun. You know what I mean? I can't believe you just said you were winging it. You're doing a great <laughs> job of winging it. <laughs> Deb, I want to ask this to you because, I, you know, you're the mastermind to me. You always have actionable steps of what you need to do from start to finish. If I was a trainer and I had nice, uh, a nice, comfortable uh, egg nest over here, and then I wanted to decide to have, take a leap of faith somewhere else, what do you think are the best steps if, if you're a trainer or a coach to take that leap of faith and then start something that, that's going to have a positive impact in the community that you're going to? Oh man, that's a great question. It's actually loaded. Uh, I could answer that better in my 90 day program for, for trainers and coaches to help them to uh, scale their business. But I'll give you a short version of that answer. Uh, the first thing that I would do is make sure that, you know, I understand why I'm actually going to this new place, you know, making sure that you have some clarity. And that's what I do with a lot of my clients, you know, writing down what are the things that really matter to you, you know, writing down the three most important areas of your life and then really making sure that you're putting the effort into those areas and making sure that this is a move that it will, will hopefully put you in a better situation. Um, after you do that and you know that this is really, really what you want to do deep down inside and it's not a, just an emotional based decision because I know I used to make straight up emotional decisions. Uh, so, you know, when you take your emotions out of it and you really write it down and put it on paper after that the next thing to do is to get aggressive, you know, reverse engineer that thing and really ask yourself, you know, how many clients do you actually have write it down I'm talking about do you have group clients do you have private clients do you have uh, uh, semi-private clients, like what, what do those clients look like? How could you still add value to those people that's in your network? If you weren't around them 24 seven, if you weren't in the gym, how could you still add value to them, right? And I would start that, right? What a smaller portion of whatever that thing is. If you say, hey, you know, I'm a, a, let's say you're a physical trainer, right? And you got these clients and you've been adding value to them. And now you've been doing this in-person training and now you wanna pick up and leave. I would make sure that I'm still giving them that same satisfaction. Hey guys, I'm going to add in a, a YouTube video that's going to give you different things that you could do every single week when you're not with me. Mm -hmm. So now you're kind of winging them off of being with you. Then I would actually get somebody that's in that field that you can make a deal with, right? Where you can say, hey, I'm leaving. Uh, I have 32 personal clients that I want to now give, I want to help your business and I want to help you grow. I want to do something together. 
And you wanna monetize that. You don't wanna just leave your clients out there with anybody. You wanna just leave them out there to fend for themselves. Like we have trainers that we work with till today. You know, uh, Aisha is one of, the, one of the people that we sent some people to. We sent some people to a couple of other people that Babe is very close friends with. Mary, yep. Yep. So, you know, so we put these people in situations where we can help them grow as well. And that's what I would do because, you know, business is all about helping somebody else, you know, so making sure that you're able to put those clients into a situation where they're still comfortable and they can still grow and you still monetize that deal because that is a business transaction. Mm -hmm. Then I would look into that area that I'm going to making sure that I could build some clientele there, just doing a couple free events. Even if you want to go early, you know, we came early and we did, we did a couple free training sessions for some of the high school girl teams out here. Uh, we did some free, we do some, free, I got a free talk tomorrow at a, a boys tryout for AAU program. I'm trying to build attraction. I want to be attractive in the market. Once I'm attractive in the market, I'm going to actually start to advertise. Then when I start advertising, now I'm speaking the language of the people that I want to work with. Once I speak that language, I guarantee that your, your business is going to grow, not as fast as you want it to, because you don't want to grow too fast because it's going to be too hard for you to handle. Like Babe said, we grew extremely fast and it was very <laughs> difficult to yes. handle uh, at the beginning. Yes. Um, so I would make sure, you know, you take those three steps. Yeah, listen, that, that was a great, great soup to nuts answer. I feel like I don't have to read the, the 90 day. Um, <laughs> at all. And, and maybe I should just transcribe this and give it to everyone. But Gabby, I, I did want to ask you, as you said, you, you were winging it and you guys did spread your wings too fast and too far. Uh, but listen, you guys made it work, you know, and that's why I always respect you two. Um, if you can go back to that five years, um, if you can give advice to yourself and now that you're starting a new here and you can right those wrongs, what do you think, what advice would you give yourself five years ago? Um, you need systems in place. Uh, I just was like, we, we, we had the gym Tuesday and Thursday and we're like, let's see how many kids we can get in there. We didn't have no system. We didn't know who was coming in the gym, who was paying, how they were paying, um, you know? So I would say systems. You need the back office to be, um, to be nice and neat. You need to have a CRM where you're getting these email addresses and you're getting people's phone numbers so you um, can reach out to them. Um, I remember before we had a tech service, I was texting everybody individually. And when I mean it was a nightmare, if I walked into the gym and there was chairs there because there was a concert, now I got to tell everybody, I got to text individually everybody and I don't even know who was coming, you know, right. so that was a nightmare. So I would say get your systems down pat. Um, and then your business will run smoothly. Deb, what, what advice would you give yourself five years ago that you didn't know that you know now that you're going to do right now? Uh, you know, I would say, you know, focus on the process, man. Focus on um, getting better every single day in your craft uh, and not the results. Uh, I think a lot of times as a young business owner, as a young entrepreneur, as a young coach, uh, as a young leader, you know, we, we have expectations in our head. And sometimes if we don't hit those expectations in our head, we think that it was a failure. Yeah. Uh, but I've learned that it's not a failure. If you tried something new and it didn't work, that actually helps your percentages of finding something that does work. Yeah. So now that you know that that doesn't work, you can pivot and you can do different things, which you've been talking about. And you actually talk about that a lot on your podcast, being able to find these different things and go through different things and experiences. So I, I definitely think that being able to pivot uh, and, and find these different things that, that didn't work actually help you a lot as well as a young business owner. But, you know, making sure that you change your perspective. Mm. Uh, I can't say that enough. You yes. know, you have to be able to focus on solutions because people pay you a different type of bag when you can solve real problems. Mm. When you come with a whole bunch of fluff and stuff that you want to do and ideas, people don't pay you for ideas. Everybody got an idea. Everybody got something that they think is the next whatever, whatever. But the people that get paid are the people that solve problems. So once we were able to really sit down and write out, you know, and, and I did this with my wife. I literally just said, hey, you was a college student, a college student athlete. What are some of the things you struggled with while you was at practice? Why, what did you struggle with? And it made her have to think about her, her own personal experiences. And it helped me as a coach to understand, you know, hey, these students, they dealing with a lot of other stuff that nobody's really even touching on. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people talk about the game is 80% mental, but who's coaching the mental side? 
every time I look in the gym, they tell you run in this spot, do this move, yep. do that move. Very true. You know, like really getting you on the phone and saying, yo, how you feel? What's going on with you? How was school? Did you learn something today? Mm -hmm. What did you learn today? And that was something that we had a chance to really slow down and do during the pandemic, even with my nephew. You know, I had a, a good amount of time that I could spend with my nephew because most of the time I was training him. And that's all he knew me as. And, you know, and uncle is my trainer. And I was like, you know, we need to have a relationship. We need to be able to talk to one another. So I went upstairs and played Madden with him and, and we did other stuff, but I had a chance to really get to know him and get into his mind. So I think that that's a huge thing, developing what we call uh, the athlete's mindset, but in business, that's the CEO mindset. The CEO mindset, when you, when you know everything is coming in as well as what's going out, Absolutely. and it's not just with your money, it's mm. everything coming into your ears. What are you listening to? Are you listening to positive podcasts that can move the needle in your business, in your career? Are you listening to the referee rail where you can hear people that went through different things? And that's why I love the platform that you built, because every time I listen to it, I'm, I'm being able to take away something. I'm being able to take away something that's going to be able to help me to grow. Yeah, listen, somebody nailed it, put put the nail on the head. Um, they they said that, you know, you, you're a smart person because you took your little refereeing thing that you do and you realize you all you do is interview people that are very successful and you hear their motivation as to why they're doing the things. You know, so that's that's interesting that you said that. And I feel like that's another program. We can call that the 24 hour timeout. You know, like the whole thing. <laughs> maybe you should I write like that it. down, Deborah. <laughs> I, I, like I like that. that. <laughs> I like that. Hey, when I tell you, I execute on stuff now. Don't don't get me That's done 100%. now. I'm, I'm in full fledged mode, baby. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. And you know, I, I think about some of the best basketball players. You know, aside from New York, have come from North Carolina, right? So I, I think a Chris Paul is the next Paul. <laughs> Your lineage is going to be one of the best basketball players going on. What I wanted to ask y'all is. You know, a year time, five years, 10 years, where do you guys see yourself now that you're laying down roots in North Carolina? Well, I would say um, we definitely want to, we want another shot. Well, they want another shot at college coaching. So I've, I love that. We love basketball. We met off of basketball at the final four um, in Nashville, Tennessee. So um, I, where he was a coach at Marshall University. So I would love for him to get another shot. And you never know, husband and wife as a coach. I don't mm. think that's not, that doesn't sound too bad. Yeah, so, no. uh, you know, I would say in five years, I hope to to be at a um, nice level in college basketball and, um, you know, spreading the athlete's mindset around and making student making sure student athletes um, just get to that next level. Because I know when I was in um, college, after college, I'm like, oh, my God, what do I do? I never had a job before. Right. I never what do I do? You know, so I want to make sure that we provide that for kids, um, that they have somewhere to go, that they will have a job when they get out of college and things like that. So um, I would say in, in five years and, and definitely um, having kids for sure. Uh, by, by that time, I hope we have two little nuggets. <laughs> I, I got my two. So I, I completely understand. Is, is blowing the whistle going to be in the future or not? That's that's done. You know, I love officiating. I really do. Um, but for me, it's a little too structured for me. You know, it's a little too stiff. I love it though, because I've learned the game in all different cylinders from That's important. coaching to refing to training. So, I mean, all three of those, um, and I, lo I love it still to this day, when I watch basketball games, I'm like, Oh, look at that. Ooh, he was sharp. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I love officiating and, and you never know. You know, yeah. you never know. Yeah, yeah. But I, I will say that th that experience right there, the, the, the triumvirate of playing at a high level, the coaching and then the refing part, I think it just makes you a well-rounded person. And, you know, I'll always say this to you. Um, as much as I enjoyed refing with you, I, I think you're better served as a coach. I truly believe that. You know, I think you're just a gifted motivator and you're just best served, I, you know, and, and I'm, that's no disrespect to your ref because I do miss you on the court. But yeah. I, I think you coaching it. And just from your perspective, Devin, um, where do you see yourself a year from now, five years from now, 10? Yeah, like Babe said, you know, I definitely want another shot at uh, college coach. And I'm hoping that, you know, um, I'm praying that we coach together. I want to sit on the sideline with my wife. I want to be able to show the, the young student athletes that, you know, you can do this together and it don't have to be a problem. You know, sometimes when people think about relationships and people working together, uh, you know, we work with a lot of other couples as well. 
And the one thing that I always tell the guys that I work with is include your wife, you know, make sure that your wife knows what's going on, knows that you're on these Zoom calls, that you're getting better, different things like that. So I would, I would say, you know, five to 10 years from now, I definitely would love to be coaching with my wife. Uh, but I definitely want another shot at college coaching. You know, I felt like when I was an assistant coach at Marshall University, I was very young and immature. Uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be uh, transparent with you. I, I thought that I knew a lot. I thought that I knew a lot about what was going on. I thought that my way was a great way. Uh, and sometimes I kind of, I showed that. And I thought that I was very, very um, driven by wins and losses. And now I'm not, you know, now I'm driven by the process. Now I'm driven by helping others become better, helping a, a, a program to become better. You know, I'm, I'm fine with taking a program that people don't think is a really good program and turning that program around. Um, you know, I, I just think that any anything that we can add, add value to mm -hmm. at this point, I feel like we're, we're very organized, we're very capable, uh, and we're highly qualified for those positions. When was the last time you blew the whistle? Man, it's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while since I blew the whistle. I would no, say. No, no, we, um, we were in the pandemic. We oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, yeah we, did, we did a couple games. Yeah. Uh, but I also will say, just like you said earlier, I'm also a better coach. Once again, I agree. I'm a better coach because I know the game from a totally different lens. Yeah. And even when I coach AAU sometime against other coaches, there are different things that I'm able to do because I have a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, and I have, I've learned the game through different levels and different brims. So uh, I think that I, I honestly feel like every coach should be licensed as an official, mm -hmm. just so you understand the game better. I think that it helps you. I also think that coaches should actually become teachers as well, because I also feel like the teacher has helped me a lot more as a coach as well. Yeah. I feel like I would be an ineffective basketball coach only because like I've always, every time I remember I did coach for one year at Kellenberg. I felt as though I just left a Jay-Z concert mad. Cause I, <laughs> I, I just don't like the yelling. See volleyball suits me. Cause it's like, I do my dirt yeah. in practice. Yeah, yelling, yeah. performing, that's it. You know, like yeah. when, when they're static with the referee, we just talk to the captain and they, they do a little talk very secretly. And, and that's, that's more my mode. But I will never, I will never officiate volleyball. I will mm. never officiate volleyball. Really? But see, that's where I'm best served in the coaching part. But yeah. guys, this has been great. I'm so happy to catch up with you guys, man. Um, just, I know you, you guys got a lot of things to plug in. So just, I want to give you guys the opportunity to just let everyone know how, how we can get involved with G3G and, and Trust the Grind. Yeah, so um, Trust the Grind is, is for our student athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're a student athlete or, the, or a parent of a student athlete, and you know, your child is really wanting to get to the next level. And when I say the next level, I'm not talking about college necessarily, but that could be one of the levels. But if your child wants to make a team, you know, if they, if they want to get on that high school team, whatever they want to do, that's what we help people do, get to that next level. Uh, and we do that by majority of our coaching being mental. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of uh, mentality coaching, building that athlete's mindset. Uh, so they can reach out to us. Uh, we act, we'll actually, we'll drop our phone number. Uh, you can text us at 631-993-4411. Uh, we'll definitely get back to you. Uh, you can also visit our website. Right now, we we actually in the process of uh, switching it over. No, we, it's trustthegrindathletics.com. Look at that. You know what I'm saying? When you, when your wife is, is on the system, when she got a system, <laughs> Definitely. that's what happened right there, right? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> what happened when you start doing business and you stop hustling. Yes, and um, hit us up on um, Instagram, uh, Gabrielle underscore Gibson Paul. And Devrin underscore underscore Paul, P-A-U-L. Devrin is D E B. R I N N. Uh, and you can also, you can check us out on my link tree. I have all of our services there as well. So if you go to link tree backslash Devrin, uh, you can actually schedule a free strategy session. Uh, I'll walk you through different things. Uh, if you're a business owner, or even if you're one, somebody that just has a side hustle, right? We actually have a segment that we're, we're doing on next Saturday called Side Hustle Saturday. Uh, where you can actually register for that call. And that's a free call. And we actually give you different ways to implement where you can increase your income, uh, whether that's you, you know, uh, on the side or whether you, whatever you're doing on the side to increase your income, we're going to help you max that out and build your own little system so you can bring more money into your household. 
Uh, and for all my business owners out there, we have a 90 day program where we help you actually do all of the back end of your business. That's helping you to, to build, scale and grow your business. Gabby, I had a question for you. Is, is this guy's brain ever off? Does he have oh, a no, 10 no, time no. chance to chill? It's, it's that, no, he, he does. He, I make I sure hope. he does. I all do. Right. I do. Just make it sure. How, how, how about Gabby? Our brain ever off or not? <laughs> nah, she she always uh, she's on 10 a hundred percent of the time. My wife is oh, like I said, she's a lion, so she's always trying to get something done. And and that's why I gotta make sure that I take I wake up earlier than her so I can get my mind right. So by the time because when she wake up, she hit the ground running. Yeah, yeah. Listen, guys, I, I, I really appreciate it. Hopefully, by the time it's part three, I'll be on episode eight hundred or whatever I'm on, man. But um, any final words you guys want to say before we part ways? I uh, actually wanted to um, just say thank you to you, man, because yes. uh, I remember when I first moved to New York, uh, somebody that I, I really looked up to and I still look up to is you. You know, you you welcomed me uh, into your network, put me into positions where I can earn more money for my family, where I could become a better person and then bringing us on your your platform and then helping me to write my first ebook. Um, I just want to say thank you to you because I feel like the consistency that you've been able to put out with your podcast has actually given me the, the confidence and the motivation to be able to stay consistent with a lot of things that I do um, as well. Absolutely. And uh, Rob, just seeing you, I mean, you kept me going with the repping, you know, uh, I would just always, like I said, we always see you in the gym. Um, and, and just doing your thing. You did, you went from one gym to the next gym. So just seeing your hustle, um, was, was, it was, was amazing. Yeah. I, I appreciate those words. I feel the same way about you, Deborah. I'm like, man, this guy got another video. Like, I feel like I gotta be on it. And, you know, I, I truly feel that I, I never really identified it this way, but you know, some people always come up to me and say like, man, you, you've been so successful with this podcast. A lot of people have been touched, but you know, I don't even look at it like that because I just am so drowning in work of trying to just keep it up and, and to make sure that it keeps going. So I never really have a time to reflect on the things of what I'm doing. Like there's a whole bunch of people that just hit me up now and I'm like, I'm doing a podcast. And you know, now like the running joke is like, what are you doing a podcast with Michael Jordan? What are you doing when with Jay-Z? But like, hey, I'm just happy that I'm doing that. And you know, I, I'll leave you with this, Gabby. Uh, one, one of the greatest compliments that I had was they were like, you know, you the you the, you the male Gabby. You the male Gabby. You are out here. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, I appreciate y'all, man. We're going to leave some more meat on the bones for a part three, whenever that is. But but trust the grind, G3G, uh, the pause. I, I, I do want to give a little motivation to anybody that may be struggling with anything as well. Um, you know, I, I think... When I made a shift in my life is when I looked in the mirror and I really got serious with myself. So I wanna give, if you're struggling, if you're going through different things in your life right now and you don't know what you're going to do next, I highly encourage you to stop making excuses and start making adjustments. Stop making excuses and start making adjustments. Mm. What that looks like is controlling the controllables. You can control your positive attitude. You can control your effort in the three most important areas of your life. If you focus on those two things and you change your mindset and you change your perspective, I guarantee that you're going to win. Yeah, and I'll just add on top of that. Before that, I'll say that um, it's never too late to change your mindset ever, right? We At the end of the day, there's always going to be another day. So you could always make that. And don't, 